So hello, today we're going to continue and finish chapter seven um, with example problems for chapter seven taking place on Friday. You have homework due tonight, assuming tonight for you is the 24th. Um, yeah. So where we left off is I introduced the rotational or the angular kinematic equations. Those are called rotational kinematic, sometimes called angular kinematic, same thing, um, which are the equations to the left on this chart. What you can see is they very much are similar to the linear ones. We just turned our V's into omegas, our A's into alphas, and our X's into thetas. I also introduced converting between linear and rotational to the left of the spinning dog, because that's a sentence I'm saying, and centripetal acceleration. And actually, we ended with me covering centripetal acceleration and yet to do anything with it. So I'm going to start right up with an example problem. And this problem says, well, the problem's not actually written really in a good way, but discus throwers, what they do is they hold the thing in their hand and they rotate their arm. Let's say a discus thrower has a length of 0.8 meters and they, I don't know why my formatting so weird here, and they turn with an angular acceleration of 50 radians per second squared. What is the total acceleration at the exact moment the angular velocity is 10 radians per second? If you want to find the total acceleration, there's two parts of acceleration if something moves in a circle. Tangential acceleration, where tangential acceleration is just angular acceleration times radius. So in this case, it would be 50 times 0.8. And there's centripetal acceleration. Centripetal acceleration being all omega squared. And so I will just go and solve for each one of these. Now, centripetal acceleration and tangential acceleration will be perpendicular from each other. But if you want to find the total, you can just add them using Pythagorean theorem. That's the general idea. OK. Now. That's the general idea here, but this isn't really how we're going to treat centripetal acceleration. See, for the most part, how we're going to do a centripetal acceleration is back to our favorite equation, Newton's second law, that we are going to relate all these centripetal acceleration stuff to, to F equals MA. You see, if something's moving in a circle, as we just covered, it's, it has centripetal acceleration. That as I spin this, and so I'm going to change the size of something for the people live won't make any difference, but for the people at home will. That if I start spinning this, what's happening is that as it spins, and actually I want to go this way, is that as it spins, it has some velocity. If I knew it a nice constant weight, so I don't change omega or the linear velocity v, you can look at it either way. I can still say that it's moving in a circle. There must be centripetal acceleration. And what it is, is if there is acceleration, there must be force. You see, anytime you have a centripetal acceleration, that means you need a centripetal force to cause it. F equals MA, there must be an F. But the thing is, is there is no centripetal force. That is not a force. We sometimes use it, but it's just a way to talk about what force causes it. The force that causes centripetal acceleration is just whatever force happens to be causing it. In this case, doing this circle, the force causing centripetal acceleration is the tension. It's moving in a circle because the string. If I let go, it stops moving in a circle. And here, I'll go this way so you can see when I hit something. But when I let go, it just goes woo and goes in a straight line. That tension keeps it on the circular path. And so when you have centripetal acceleration, what you say is that it's just you're going to solve F equals MA and say you have an acceleration equal to V squared over all or omega squared all, depending on the unit you have, and acceleration pointing radially to the middle. And it could be different things. Here it was tension. Sometimes it's gravity, which seems weird, but it's true. If I um, take this die, and try to spin this, and if I spin it slow, it stays on. Friction is the centripetal acceleration. Now, when I surpass friction, it goes flying off. But as long as I go slow enough, it stays on because friction is causing it to stay on. OK? To really explain this. 
Let's look at a car driving at a constant velocity on a nice straight flat hill. And we're going to say this car is constant velocity, no acceleration in X. Well, if there's no acceleration in X, that means the sum of forces in X is zero, but there's nothing happening in X. It's just going in a straight line constant velocity. So I can ignore X. And I can say if this car is driving along a nice, flat, straight road, I can say that it has no acceleration in Y. If it's driving along a flat road, it's not moving up, it's not moving down, it's just chugging along flat. And my free body diagram says that if this car, if this car is flat driving across the road like this, there's two forces acting on it in Y. Gravity pulls it downwards, and the normal force holds it up. So what I can say is up minus down equals zero. Normal minus gravity equals zero. N minus mg equals zero. And so if this just flies, drives across the hill, N equals mg. There you go. And that makes sense. If you're driving on a flat road, you don't suddenly go flying up or flying down. But let's say instead this car is driving over a hill, a hill that could be approximated as a piece of a sphere. If you drive over a hill fast enough, you're probably a whale, you can go airborne. And if this is driving over a hill, I need to think about, OK, what's that going to mean for it? See, let's say it's still a constant velocity. If it's still a constant velocity, it still means there's no acceleration in x. And we're not doing anything in x, so that's fine. But if this is driving over a hill and it's a curve, basically, I'm saying, and I, let's say I'm looking at this from the side, I'm saying this call is going like this over the hill. That it's just going here and just making this loop around. I can say that it's moving on part of a circular path. If it's moving on part of a circular path, it must have centripetal acceleration. And centripetal acceleration always points radially to the center of the circle. So if it's going across the top of a hill, its acceleration will be negative AC. Negative because it's going to be down. It's going to be down because we're pointing to the middle of the circle. And so the last problem, I said the acceleration was zero because it wasn't going up or down. But if it's moving in a circle, there must be acceleration. The acceleration will just be negative AC. And so my student's second law, up minus down, I'll have N minus MG equals negative MAC. Because I have the centripetal acceleration. And I can say, OK, I got to keep in mind, AC, that's V squared over O. So I can say that N minus MG equals M negative V squared over O. If you wanted to say, what is the centripetal force, which once again, I don't like saying. But if you really wanted to push what is the centripetal force, it's gravity. Gravity is what makes you move in the circle. Any questions, though? Now, an interesting thing about this problem. And I'm going to write this equation again without the extra line in it. Well, actually, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to take this last equation I wrote, and I'm going to add mg to both sides. If I add mg to both sides, what I'm going to get is that it's mg minus mv squared over all, right? And what this says is that the faster you go, the smaller n gets. But logically, if m b v if v becomes big enough, n would then go negative, which makes no sense. Here's what happens. As v gets larger, n gets smaller. Anytime your n hits zero, that means you're no longer on the ground. n means there's contact. If n equals zero, it means there's no contact. And so what it is is if n hits zero, this equation breaks down. Because if n hits zero, this car is no longer just driving over the hill. Its airborne has taken the hill as a ramp and is flying off into the great unknown. That's what that means. This is saying if you go over a hill and go fast enough, you get airborne. That's why it comes out in the math. Hell, let's solve for it. Let's say that hill in question will approximate as a circle with a radius of 50 meters. And say, what speed can you go over the hill? Oh, what is the max speed you can go and not get airborne? What is the max speed so when you go over the hill, this right here doesn't happen, but you stay on the road? 
mass of the call is not given. See, the reason I do this is because when I go over this hill, you go elbow when n equals zero. And as I just covered two slides ago now, n minus mg equals negative mv squared over o. If you want to find where you go airborne, that's when n equals zero, which means negative mg equals negative mv squared over o. I can divide both sides by negative m, multiply both sides by o, and square root. And with that, I can plug in some numbers and figure out the speed. You go less than 22.1 meters per second, you go over the hill, no issue. You go faster than 22.1 meters per second, phew, off into the air. Any questions here? Okay. On the same note, let's say you're driving, and instead of going over a hill, you're just taking a hard left turn. You do it slow, you'll make the turn. You go fast enough, you might not make the turn and skid out. Likewise, you can do a large turn really quickly, but a nice tight turn, like if you take like a left onto a road, you got to slow down a lot. The reason why is if you're trying to make your car turn, friction is what lets your car turn. It's the same idea as this of me putting this die here, that if I go slow, it stays on because friction keeps it on the path. If I go fast, it goes sliding off. You can actually figure out how fast you can make a turn if you know the radius of curvature for the turn. See, if you're driving and you take a hard left, I'm saying, your free body diagram will look like these pictures to the right, where the upper right is the above view and the lower right is the, from the view of back of the car. Your normal force is up. Gravity is down, but if you're turning, friction is causing you to turn. Without friction, you would just move in a straight line. You can't see this right now, but with friction, it keeps you on the path. And you can make your equations. I can say in y, up minus down, n minus mg equals zero. I have no acceleration in y because I'm assuming I'm staying on the road. n equals mg. But in x, I can say in X, I have friction. It's to the left, so it's negative. And as this is drawn, this person is making a turn. This is a fraction of a circle. That's a perfect circle. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And so I have to say that if it's a fraction of a circle, there's an acceleration pointing radially in, a centripetal acceleration. Now, as this is drawn to in figure B, I show that the friction is to the left, but that's the same as the direction of the acceleration. The acceleration is also to the left. So that acceleration is also negative. And I can say negative friction equals negative ma. Well, a is v squared over o. So negative friction equals negative mv squared over o. The negatives cancel out, and I get this equation. Now keep in mind, we covered way back when chapter four that friction has a maximum value. You see, when this, where's the die? When this thing makes the turn, it'll stay there for really slow speeds. Let me move this down all the way. It'll stay here for very slow speeds. It'll stay there for slightly faster speeds. It's only on real fast speeds that it goes sliding off. But as long as I go slow enough, it makes it. As long as you turn your car slow enough, it makes it. You see, you can make a turn as long as static friction is less than its maximum value. If you try to make a turn and static friction exceeds its maximum value, this will break down. Where the maximum value of static friction is mu of Sn. You want to figure out how fast you can make a turn? You just plug in friction as its max value. Keep in mind our y equation said n was mg. And I can go and I can solve for exactly how fast you can make a turn. Any questions? This centripetal accelerator, which again, we're not doing anything new. This is just f equals ma. It's just if you're moving in a circle, you have a new acceleration, acceleration that points inward.
This is also why this happens. That when I put this ball through the loop de loop, it makes the loop de loop. It stays right there. It stays. That was pretty close. I'm kind of impressed with myself. Oh, you know, I think I just hold it there eventually. Let me just go to where I hold it there. It'll stay on the loop or until it hits the end, even when it's upside down. Even though you would think gravity should be pulling it downward and keeping it off the loop, it'll stay there as long as it's fast enough. If it goes too slow, like I just did there, it won't stay. But when I put it, when it's right here for that brief moment in time, it stays there right there for the brief moment in time because of centripetal acceleration. Let me explain why. When I do a loop de loop, let's look at two points. We're going to look at the bottom of the loop and the top of the loop. So I'm going to start with looking at the ball when it's right there. When the ball is right there, and I'm not looking at it at this moment in time. I'm looking at the ball when it's right there, really, when it's right here, right? I'm looking at it when it's there and movement. It's just kind of hard to always look at movement. So for now, let's just pretend it's moving. At that spot, when it's moving, I can make a free body diagram. I can say at that moment, there's two forces acting on the ball. The normal force is holding it up, and gravity is pulling it down. Right? I don't think anyone can question that right here. Well, F equals MA, up minus down equals MA. That means up is N, down is MG. So N minus MG equals MA. But this is moving in a circle. If it's moving in a circle, there must be centripetal acceleration. Now, I'm going to ask one of you guys. There's not many people in the room, but I'm going to make it work for this. What direction is the centripetal acceleration? Up. It's up because it always points to the middle of the circle. It actually says toward center of circle right here. I probably should have realized I wrote that. And we can solve for the value. The value is just v squared over all. And so we'll say n minus mg equals mv squared over all. What that means is the faster you go, the larger n is. Because if I add mg to both sides, I'll get n equals mv squared over all plus mg. And the faster you go, the larger your normal force is. This makes sense if you've ever been in a roller coaster. When it does that big dip, you kind of feel down into the chair a little bit. You feel heavier. That's because the chair is pushing harder up against you. You don't weigh more. You just feel like you weigh more because there's more force pushing you up. And that's how we notice weight. Now, if, v, if n equals 0, that means you left the surface. But n can never be 0 here. The smallest n can be is mg which means you can never fall through the surface, which makes sense, because even when it's not moving, it doesn't fall through the surface. But the bottom's boring. Let's look at the top. You see, when this goes through, whee, it's when it's upside down it gets interesting. When it's here, pretend it's still moving so I'm not holding it. Because at that point, it stays up against the metal track. It doesn't just instantly fall. It stays up there. And in fact, as long as I go fast enough, oops, as long as I go fast enough, it makes the loop. It's only when it's going real slow that it can't make the loop. Come on, go slow, right here. This time I'm not going as fast. It doesn't make it. The reason why is let's look at the forces. Now, this is kind of weird, but let's look at the forces here, right? There's two forces acting on it, gravity and normal. Gravity is straight down because gravity is always straight down. But let's think about the normal. This ball is underneath the loop. The loop is here and the ball is there. Normal points away from the surface. And you see, this is being fall down for it. The direction of the normal force, what direction the normal force is in, is down. Gravity is down, but normal force is also down. Normal force is also down because it's on the bottom of the surface. When I did the um, audio problem, the car going about over the hill, there it was positive because it was on top of the loop. But when it's on the bottom of the loop, your normal force points down. Now, as long as your normal force is not zero, 
you stay on the track. If your normal force ever hits zero, you're not going to make it. It means you're no longer pushing up against it. And what I'll say is up minus down. No forces point up. Only forces point down. So I'll say we have zero minus n minus mg, and my acceleration is also down because my acceleration points to the middle of the circle. So at negative n minus mg equals negative ma. Well, once again, a is just v squared over O. Now, if you note, every single term here has a negative. I have negative n, negative mg, negative mv squared over O. And if every single term is negative, I can multiply through by negative 1 and cancel it all out. That's the same as positive n plus positive mg equals mv squared over O. And as long as you're fast enough, you will have a normal force. You see, if I subtract mg from both sides, I can rearrange this and solve for the minimum speed required to make the loop. Um, if I subtract mg from both sides, I'll get n equals mv squared over o minus mg. If you want to find the minimum force to not to go airborne, that's going to be when n equals 0, which allows me to cancel out my m's. And if you rearrange and solve, you eventually get the speed will be the square root of gl. That as long as your speed is faster than the square root of gl, you'll stay up there. And the faster you go, the larger the value of n you'll feel. But you'll only stay up there if you have the large amount of speed. As soon as you have less speed, you don't make it. Questions? OK, let's show an even crazier example of this. What? Where is it? Hold on a second. I missed one. When I opened up my videos, I forgot to open one. So give me a second. It is opening now. OK, here's what I get. I have a little cup and some water with some food coloring that I'm going to pour the water into the cup. And I'm going to put it on a platform. There is nothing holding it to this platform. There is nothing holding the water in the cup but gravity right now. I can take this and start moving it around and even start spinning it. All of the water stays in the cup. It doesn't go pouring down over my head just because we're following Newton's laws. You'd like to think that while the cup is upside down, you'd, like, you'd logically think that if the cup is, ah, I'm close enough, the cup's over here, that if the cup is upside down, you would naturally think the water should pour out of it. The water should fall. But that doesn't match the free body diagrams. At the highest point, Gra the force of gravity on the water is down, but the normal force is also down because the water is sitting in the cup. And so it's up against the thing. If it's upside down, it's just up against the thing. And so the same logic will hold true, that as long as I spin fast enough, it will stay in the cup. In fact, to see this even crazier, this is a, a pilot pouring water into a cup while doing a barrel roll. You can see it in the background of his video. At all times, the water falls what to him is down. Because as long as he spins fast enough, it'll have that acceleration. It just isn't acceleration due to gravity. It's an acceleration due to centripetal acceleration. Any questions? Let's do another example. This one is very similar to a homework problem. There's something called a Gravitron ride. You might have seen it before. I don't know. It's this thing where you get in it, you get up against the wall, and it starts spinning real fast. When you spin real fast, you're going to go up against the wall. And as you're up against the wall, they drop the floor out beneath you, and you stay up against the wall. Remember what I'm talking about? This happens. Say it again. Best ride ever. <laughs> there you go. This happens because of centripetal acceleration. See, let's make a free body diagram of you up against the wall. That sounds bad. What I can say is that there's a wall here made red, and you 
up against it and say this is spinning. And let's just say it's like spinning like this, right? That this, the direction of the spin is right now coming out of the screen towards you into a big circle. Basically, going back to this guy, is that it's the same thing as this, but now there's a wall here. And it's stuck up against the wall as it spins just because of how fast it's moving. I don't have something good like this with a wall on it, so I can't make a demonstration. When this spins, what forces are acting on you? Assume there's friction. I'll give you that one. What forces are acting on the person when this thing spins? How about you guys? One of you. Uh, normal gravity yep. centripetal. Yep. Yep. Centripetal is not a force. <laughs> it's an oh, acceleration. Right, right. What actually holds you up on the wall is you're up against the wall, is friction. Friction is what holds you up. See, when you're up against the wall, and I, I, there's nothing good for me to push up because I guess the back of my chair. When you're up against, now in the case of the chair, but you're up against the wall, what it is is friction keeps you from sliding down. If that because you have, there's a friction coefficient between you and thing, and that's why it's normally kind of like a coarse material, you're just going to, friction can hold you up. And the normal force is going to be to the right heel, because when this spins, that's your, you're up against the wall. The normal force is to the side. Now, if you're staying on the wall and your acceleration y is zero, is this says acceleration is zero, but I mean y. If you're not sliding up the wall or sliding down the wall, and sliding up the wall would be basically impossible, so let's ignore that, unless it's at an angle. We can go and we can solve for the equation. See, in x, x is right minus left. But when I look at this, there's nothing to, in x except for the normal force. So that means the normal force equals ma, Well, a is v squared over all. Or you could say a equals omega squared all. Use whichever one makes your life easier. In y, y is up minus down. But if you're not going up the wall or down the wall, your y is going to be up minus down equals zero. Static, static friction minus gravity equals zero. Well, keep in mind mu of a, or f of s is going to be less than or equal to mu of sn. What this says is the faster it spins, the larger n is. The larger n is, the larger f of s can be. And so the faster it spins, the larger friction can be. And if it spins fast enough, friction can become strong enough to counteract gravity, as long as you move quickly enough. Any questions though? Let's do one other example. Uh, this next one is actually a homework assignment. Um, the equations will kind of match. It's going to look a little different because the way I asked it, I'm not going to just give you the homework assignment here, but it's kind of interesting. The homework assignment says that there's a puck moving in a circle with no friction attached to a rope and a mass hanging on it. And it talks about how fast the puck needs to move for the block to have no acceleration. I'm going to solve it saying, let's give it acceleration and see what happens. And I'm going to make do this, not that video, by what I have is a string going through a piece of metal that's loosely there. And I have a weight on one side and a wooden ball on the other. What it is to see it can move freely is if I start swinging this ball, if I swing it at the right speed, it'll stay at the exact same height. If I swing it slowly, the weight accelerates down. Swing it quickly, the weight accelerates up. I can control the acceleration of the ball, of the weight. Is it going up, down, or staying in place just by how quickly I swing this? They'll go back up. The reason for this you can see with free body diagrams. See, if I look at that weight on the bottom, which is labeled as M2 here, I can say there's two forces acting on M2. Gravity pulls it down and tension holds it up. Move we'll it from the side. If I look at that puck, I'm going to look at the puck from the top because, I mean, gravity is going to put it down to the table and the normal force is going to hold it up. 
Um, really, there should be with this guy without a table. I should have to deal with a little bit of that Theo too, but I'm going to ignore that fact and pretend the table is there. If I look at it from above, I'm going to ignore gravity and normal because they're into and out of the thing respectively. But what I have is the tension is what keeps it on this circle. That without the tension, it doesn't stay on the circle. And that's true still when I do it, I'm too high, <laughs> when I do it like this. Sorry, I can't do it horizontally and be on the screen and not hit things. So we're going to stick to vertically. That's true that the tension is the only thing acting on it. But if that puck, sorry, so I can say F equals MA. And I can say for the block, up minus down equals MA. That T minus M2G equals M2AY, aka A of Y being the acceleration due to gravity in Y. Um, on the homework problem, it says to assume there's no acceleration in Y. So on the homework, you just say A of Y equals zero. I didn't do this here just because I was trying to show it in general. But for the homework, you can say A of Y is zero. For the puck, I can say there's only one first tension. And T equals MA. But in this case, my A is my V squared over O. And what I can do is I can just say that this T right here is that T. They're connected. And shove it in there. And what I get is that depending on the speed I spin it at, this puck will either move up or down or stay at the same height. That depending on how fast I swing, come on, go back to swinging. Depending on how fast I swing, I can start messing with that. I can edit the height and whatnot. Any questions? OK. I'm going to do one more example, and I'm going to fully solve this next one. This next one, if you haven't noticed, I like to play with toys. Like toys from my childhood is what I use for teaching these classes. Um, this one isn't quite from my childhood. Someone gave me this in college. But in college, I was given this Batman figurine. And this Batman figurine has a small fan on him. I think I showed in this video. And what is this small fan? gives him a little bit of a force pushing in one direction. And if you turn on the fan and set it spinning, he makes a nice circle like so. And he'll just kind of go forever until the batteries die. Just spinning. I don't know why Batman can fly. You think Superman would make more sense? Someone gave it to me. I have no idea. So let's say I get this going, right? My question's all. And I'll get into some of the crazy shit I did with this problem for in a little bit. When this toy, I got its mass. It weighs 0.16 kilograms. And, um, okay. When I first set this up, I was doing it in class. I filmed me doing it and then took screenshots of the film. As you can tell, the video I have here and the screenshot to the left do not match. That's because I lost that video and made a new one. But when I first did it with this other video, which you can see the angle is vastly different. The distance of the string was 0.45 meters. And the angle he made was 45 degrees. That <laughs> I measured that angle by holding a protractor up to my monitor, not the world's most scientific way to do it, but whatever, it works. And my question is, when he's spinning like this, what is the tension in the string? And what is his angular velocity? Any questions? So when I do this in class, I have this going the entire time, and it makes this horrible like noise as it goes. So you get this in, with only me talking for silence. So a singular good thing about being online. It's nice to finally have one. Here's what I know. I know his mass. I know the length of the string. And I know the angle. I want the tension in the string and his angular velocity. So let's solve it. See, what I can say is I can make a free body diagram. I can say what forces are acting on Batman. 
And I'll ask you guys, what forces are acting on Batman Hill? Normal gravity and tension? Close. Normal only happens when you're touching a surface. There's no oh, normal right. heel. Right. There's so gravity, gravity and, tension? and tension. Yep. There's okay. no normal because he's not standing on the ground. There was a normal in this figure to the right. But here there is no normal. And so I look and say, okay, gravity's down and tension's along the string. But if I use a standard coordinate system, that tension is at an angle. So I want to take that tension and say, screw that noise. Let's break it up. Let's say, what is the tension in X? What is the tension in Y? Well, the tension in X will be T cosine theta. Now, it happens to be 45 degrees, and I know the cosine of 45 is the square root of 2 over 2. My tension in Y will be T sine theta. Well, I happen to know that the sine of 45 is also square root of 2 over 2. Once again, the fact it's 45 is just coincidence. I just held a protractor up to the screen. I'm like, shit, it's exactly 45. Sweet. It just made my math easy. Once I know that, I can make my force equations. Because I'll say f equals ma. But f equals ma is really two equations, one in x and one in y. Now, as he spins, trying to make everything fit here that I want at once. As he spins, when he first starts, starts he wobbles a little bit. But once he starts spinning, there's no real change in y, that he's just kind of moving flat across this plane. And so in y, there's no acceleration. And so my first equation will just be up minus down. ty minus mg equals 0. But let's look at x. In x, he's moving in a circle. If I looked at it from above, it would just be like him going, wee. And so what I can say in x, is that he does have acceleration. Acceleration that points to the middle of the circle. And where this is drawn here to the middle of the circle is to the left, which is negative. So in x, I have t of x. Oh, sorry, I have nothing to the right, right minus left. So I have 0 minus t of x equals negative ma. The negatives, once again, because it's to the left. But I can divide both sides by negative 1 and cancel out my negative. So there's my equation. T of y minus mg equals 0, and T of x equals mac. Let's start with my y equation. My y equation says T of y minus mg equals 0. That means T of y equals mg. But keep in mind, T of y was T sine theta, or T sine 45, or T times the square root of 2 over 2. And if I multiply both sides by 2, divide both sides by the square root of 2, I can get an equation for the tension. That the tension in the string is 2 times the mass times g over the square root of 2, which is 2.2 .2 newtons. Good so far? Let's look at x. In x, I said t of x equals mac. But a of c is either v squared over r or omega squared r. I could use either one. Now, in this problem, I said, what is omega? So let's use the omega version. It has what we're looking for. Thing is, I need to know what r is. We know the length of the string. We do not know r. r is the radius of the circle. Let's go back to the video. You see, this, oops, ah, did not mean to do that. I'm just going to keep it here for a second. This right here, ah, I am failing miserably at what I'm trying to do. This is what we were given, this value here. But when he spins in a circle, all is going to be this right here. It'll be how big of a circle he makes from the center of the circle to where he ends up. That line is definitely not in the right spot. More like here. 
That is what all is, the radius of his circular path. And so I'm going to have to solve for that. What I'm going to do is I'll say that there I got this big triangle, and I know L I want all. But so Katoa, man, the cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. That means the cosine of this angle right here is all over L. And that angle right, which means if I multiply by L, that all is L cosine of theta. And that angle was 45 degrees, so I could just solve for it. I'm actually not going to bother. I'm just going to make things cancel out. But I know that angle. So yeah, I could just solve for all, but as I said, I'm not going to bother. And I'll just say that T of X equals MAC. That T of X equals M omega squared all. T of X is T cosine theta. So T cosine theta equals M omega squared all. But all is L cosine theta. And my cosine theta is cancel out. So I'll divide both sides by ML and square root. And by plugging in my numbers, I can solve for a value. Now, in the initial video for this, the one I lost, not the one I'm showing, I mean, I just didn't bother saving it. I never thought I'd teach this online and I'd always have it in person in class. But in the initial video, I timed it. What I did is I started a stopwatch and I timed for a minute and I counted how many revolutions per minute he had. And then I convert the radiance per second. And when I did it, my actual, the real version, I got 5.4 radiance per second, which is pretty goddamn close considering I figured out my angle by holding a protractor up to a computer monitor. It all works. Okay, questions though? Okay, if that's it, um, I'm going to stop there. Have a good day, and we'll do example problems on Friday.